Uh, thanks for tuning in to this uh, special one-shot live episode of The Great Game. Um, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you're from. Uh, today we're having a chat about board game mechanics, but uh, first of all, I'll throw over to my co-host um, to introduce our guests today. Yes, hello everyone. Um, yeah, so if you haven't uh, checked out our podcast before, uh, I am Jack of The Great Game. Uh, I've designed a couple of mega games in Australia, including God Emperor is the big one. Uh, and with us today we have Jason. Tell us a bit about yourself, Jason. Um, I'm, J- I'm, I'm Jason Cott. So I've worked with Jack um, with a few different Brisbane Mega Games, helping to do a little bit of the testing um, as well as helping run them through. Um, and I also do some uh, board game design and development um, for myself. Yeah, absolutely. And we also have uh, Tristan. How's it going, Tristan? I run... Oh, not too much. Um, I'm Tristan, uh, Tristan Cliff. I'm one of the co-founders of Melbourne Mega Games down here in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I uh, haven't fully designed a game myself, but I've uh, taken a few games, adapted them, inserted mechanics, rebalanced them, played around with them, tweaked here and there, and and, uh, enjoy tinkering with games. Awesome. Awesome. And of course, Patrick. Yes, and I am Patrick. Um, also from the great game and from the city mega gamers and i've had a lot of experience um stealing mechanics and applying them to mega games which is what we're going to be talking about today um broadly um so we, we wanted to get together today and have a chat about um mega game design but it's a pretty broad subject and there's a lot of ifs and buts and questions around um what defines a mega game etc uh so what we decided we we're going to have a chat about uh, is mechanical design and also mechanical adaptation. So how to how do, how do you get to the mechanics of a mega game and uh, where your inspiration comes from? And sometimes it's, you know, a bit more than inspiration. It's grabbing things that exist and applying them in a new context. So um, that that's, that's what we're after. Um, I thought I'd just kick it off and quickly go around. Um, Jack and Tristan, when you guys are looking at mega games and and Jason, when you even when you're looking at just regular board game design, where do you take your inspiration from, Jack? Sure, I I can start off. So I always think, um, you know, the old phrase is uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. That's always been my philosophy. I just steal whatever I can (laughs) from everywhere I can. Um, Just in design, right? Just, oh, uh, well, you know, that's a, that's a topic for another podcast. But um, so usually with, with mega games, I have taken a, a lot of inspiration from board games in the past. And that's been uh, one of the primary things I often take from. Um, the, uh, so for God Emperor, for example, uh, each uh, sub game of that was inspired by a different board game. The war map was inspired a lot by diplomacy. The uh, underground espionage section was inspired by the card game Android Netrunner. Uh, and the politicsy court bit of the game was inspired a, a bit, at least, by the politics part of Twilight Imperium. Um, so that's something I usually do is I look at a lot of board games. Um, yeah. I, and that, I, I'll leave it at that for now, at least. Um, how about you, Tristan? Mm. Was that for me? Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think, to me, when I when I look at uh, adapting mechanics or inserting new mechanics, um, the key is underpinning what the game is about. So I feel like each mega game has a, has a crux, um, uh, and and the mechanics generally all work towards this crux. Um, so, uh, for example. Um, the, the game that's coming up, we're looking at adding a press team in when previously they were a control team. And in their mechanics, uh, this game's all about essentially going on these expeditions. It's called It Belongs in a Museum. It's about going on these expeditions. Um, and a key part of this is each player is a, is a person in the world and has skills that they can actually actively use on these expeditions. And so to make the press team really feel involved and part of the world and have you know power other than just publishing media, which is really important, um, we actually gave them skills as well. We made them really good, so they're really appealing to take along on these expeditions um, because the crux of this game, right, is is um, getting uh, essentially 
uh, getting on these expeditions and doing things as a character and being like, I did this really cool thing. And so uh, that was essentially looking at what's the crux of the game, all right? What's, what's the rest of this game doing? And, and what, what does, what's really important to be targeted at the rest of, of this game? And how can ever, this new mechanic that we're adding in, how does that fit in with everything else and, and chime in and I interact mm. with, with the other systems that already exist, as well as this new system where we're essentially designing and adding in as well. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's really cool to look at uh, essentially other games and, and uh, borrow slash steal from them, but also looking at the same game that you're putting something into and seeing how it, how it interacts and, and interplays, you almost steal from those other systems that already exist, um, uh, which is really a, a nice way to, to both balance a new system and also uh, create it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a really important one. Um, and I think that's something that I've, I've stumbled into a couple of times, doing, creating separate mechanics for different areas for the sake of it and actually striving to make them different when actually they should all be building to the same thing. Um, Jason, where's your design inspiration come from? Um, I think it is often hard to say exactly where it comes from because often when doing whatever sort of design, you start making a thing and you're making you're like, oh, I'm doing it for a while. And then you kind of look back and say, okay, these are the reasons, this is where I got this from. So I don't know that I stole something from Android Netrunner until I put it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> like it is, it is somewhat unconscious, but then once you kind of realize, okay, this is actually really similar to this game that I've played before and this similar to that game. And then looking back on those inspirations and trying to work out, okay, this is why it works there and this is how it could work here yep yep i found that's a that's like the classic um you know there's no new ideas something's already mm -hmm. everything's already been done somewhere i've definitely stumbled into that as well even with sort of settings and genres and stuff for games um great so uh what direction like i think i can already call this out but for the three of you but generally speaking when you're when you are designing and looking at a mega game specifically or, or a board game are you generally creating or are you adopting and i feel like jack's adopting tristan's a bit of both and jason is unknowingly adopting is that right <laughs> i'm definitely normally adopting it i mean i think when you are adopting obviously um it's never as simple as just porting it in, right? Or just plugging in a mechanic from somewhere else. It always does need to be something that um, is all working together with the rest of the package. But the first inspiration is usually looking at other stuff and adopting it. That's definitely often my way of thinking of things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's 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 almost hard to separate into the categories of creating and adopting, right? Because everything comes from some sort of inspiration. For me, when True. I'm sitting down and talking about a game, okay, what do I want to get out of this game? Well, it's either I've got a really cool theme and I want to explore that theme. Um, for example, you know, the, the, the famous one is, oh, I want to make First Encounter a, a mega game, or I want to make uh, Battlestar Galactica into a mega game. Um, you know, like talking mm. about, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the mega game that everyone plays with. Watch the Skies and Den of Wolves. Right one. Yeah, the one, <laughs> and the Den of Wolves is the second one. Um, Watch the Skies dropped by my mind. But those are the two big examples, right? Those are based really heavily around thing. But the other part of that is can be, I've got this really cool mechanic and I want to suit it to a, a theme or an explore a, a world, but I, this mechanic's really the thing I'm interested in. Um, mm. So for example, we're, we're in play testing for the moment, uh, at the moment for, for a mega game, um, which is which basically wants to explore resource allocation and how do you do a really cool resource allocation system um, where resource allocation and a social like intrigue game are essentially the two core mechanics. And well, the, you know, finding a setting that to fit that was kind of the way it worked rather than the other way around where, where, set, where theme drives mechanics. Um, so I feel like, even if you're creating something wholly new or you're um, deriving something from something else, adopting it in a way, there's still definitely like one of those two core pillars that you fall under, whether it's sort of mechanics or theme first. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd say like in terms of adopting, like everything is adopted to some degree because you put it in the game system and then see where it needs to change. And I think... Mm -hmm inspiration and looking at other games is really important because it it gives you kind of that context like this game works and this produces this experience like i remember when we were going through the underground for um 
and we were looking at like Android Netrunner originally. And I know, I think Jack did that because like Android Netrunner has a very particular fi feel and that had some really obvious things that's like, okay, this is a field that could really work in the underground. And this is the thematic thing that we want to happen. And so it seems both thematically, you can take this, this thing from this game that's quite different, but mechanically it kind of produces the same experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that actually nails sort of my experience with adopting things from board games or other games into mine. The, th the theme always changes and usually that results in a slight change to the mechanics themselves. Um, but but the core is always there. Um, Jack, you were mentioning earlier when you were talking about um, Twilight Imperium, sort of pulling in some of the politics of it. Um, that was that was actually one that went under my radar after playing God Emperor. I didn't realize that that's where it was from. Um, I had a similar experience pulling from that same game with um, the trade system, where you know it, it enables players to enter. Um, diplomatic relations that are actually tied to something, but they're not even, they're not on even footing. So I always loved mm. that system. Um, I used that in a couple of games, actually. Um, before we move on, though, I've just got um, one question from the chat, which I thought um, would be good to answer um, if you guys would like to try. Um, I won't, I won't pause for all the every single question but i'll just pull them out as we go um so question from zane do you think we could ever create a core framework mechanic that mega games could build around so sort of like a cookie cutter mega game that you could then build into whatever mega game that you wanted any thoughts uh i think yes uh now i've never i've um i've tried experimenting with this approach a bit actually um uh, so I think, um, the, I'll give an example, the example that I've been trying to make work, but I never quite got it to work is that I wanted to make a game, uh, that was all themed around this bag building mechanic. And for the people who don't know, uh, bag building is where, uh, you have a little bag of chips and when you, um, uh, as you go through the game, you get to put new tokens into the bag when you level up and stuff like that. And whenever you try to do something, you rummage around and take a random token out of the bag. And that tells you how well you do with that particular thing. Um, so I thought it would be great to make a game where there are different systems, but ultimately you having a little bag of chips um, that was tying into all of them. I never managed to make it work because the economy of all these chips and how this was going to work. I mean, I I'm still interested and maybe someday it'll work out. I think it's definitely 100% um, possible. I think it's just a very difficult thing to pull off. In fact, I think it's probably more difficult than having, you know, a different mechanics for each of your sub games, because having this one central mechanic that can do it all, that's not easy, right? Like, uh, I think, yeah, that, that's my thing. I think it's possible, but I actually think it would probably be potentially harder than, um, yeah, having, having different things, even though if you could pull it off, and I think there probably are, there likely are mega games that I haven't tried that have pulled it off. But if you could pull it off, the reward would be that the, uh, the mega game would be a lot easier to, for new players to understand, right? They would go, oh, it's the same mechanic for everything. It all makes sense. Um, but from a design perspective, having every single thing tie into the one thing makes it very difficult to, you know, to pull off, at least for me. Yeah, yeah I, um, I think. I'll sorry, you go, Patrick. No, no, no I was just going to say. I feel like um, I feel like we've kind of witnessed this to some degree. Um, with with, I mean, if you think of it like in the role playing game world, where you pick up a new role playing game and it's based on the so and so system, so immediately mm -hmm. you know most of the rules, but the fluff's going to be different, and you know magic's going to become aliens and stuff like that. Um, that's a bad example, but you know, um, I feel like we've actually seen that a little bit with what I call the watch the skies model, where you yes. then get games. Um, sorry if you were going to say this, Tristan, but you get games and they've got those three core components. They've got one where people debate, uh, one where people move things on a map. Like I feel like it's we've almost got a system here, uh, like a, a template, which a lot of people have used, myself included. Um, but you can't apply that to every single thing, so it's not a over-encompassing template. I feel like you can't you can't um, create any kind of theme 
um, themed game on that template, but it is there to be used for a lot of, I guess, geopolitical games. So we're, we're halfway there, I feel, un unintentionally. But um, yeah, Tristan, do we well, get anything so to add? I was going to talk about the Watch the Skies model. And I think the interesting yep. part of, of that model is where it breaks down is, is the third part of it, um, which is that there is always sort of a rotating third part of of a mega game in those scenarios, whether it be you know intrigue or the underground, as in God Emperor, um, it's it's yeah. finding the sort of element that's key to your setting and adding that as the third system that plays into the two other systems that everyone already knows about. Um, mm. The other thing that I I think really answers this question is mega games are a social game, and the core mechanic that drives all of them is social interplay, right? Every mega game, and I was explaining this to our control team the other week for when we we're prepping for this upcoming game. Um, no matter what, all of these systems are going to be in, interlaced by the fact that people are having experiences in them. They're taking them away. They're relating them to other people. They're talking about the experiences they're having, or the, the, the stories they're creating, or things they want, the goals they've got, and that social interaction and the discussion they're having, person to person, and the relationships that exist and being built and potentially destroyed throughout the game. That's actually the core system that you don't have that much control over. Essentially, your control in that system when you're designing the game is the goals and relationships you give characters at the outset it's that beginning scenario and a lot of the the mechanics of that system if you will are the way the individual people socially interact um which is kind of the thing that makes mega games unique in that you don't know how that your core system is gonna gonna take off and and, and fire throughout the game yeah. um which is why actually jack when you spoke about diplomacy as as the inspiration for for the battle map that i found that so interesting because i think the same thing is a key system in, in that that game right um in that mega games almost wholeheartedly are derived from diplomacy where the key mechanic you know the mechanics of diplomacy itself are very simple but the, the mm. social interaction and the interplay that the relationships the starting map of diplomacy sets up are mind-bogglingly complex in their iterations yeah, definitely. And um, that's, that's something I really wanted to do. Oh, sorry, Jason, I'll eat. No, no. I, I, um, I was just going to follow up that generally, yeah, uh, when Patrick started saying that, that was also the same thing that I was thinking that Watch the Skies ha has almost kind of created, like, I think, a very default template that a lot of people look to because they pick up the game, they've, they've watched a few videos, they play it, and like, I think this could be a little better or a little different or a little bit more suited to this. And so mm -hmm. that has, like, the kind of default framework is you have teams and you have roles and players go from teams to roles and that's kind of where you get the social mechanic and then you have some sort of adversary system you have another team that's doing something slightly different and working against you um and i think that and rounds you can kind of say that's your kind of core framework that i think you know works quite well and whenever going through designing things knowing that that's a framework that you can kind of go okay this is why it works and when you start deviating from that a little bit you're like okay there's no longer teams and roles which means people no longer have those two sets of interactions and then thinking about how that works so i think the mm -hmm. core framework is there we have um played around a little bit with we are not alone in terms of there's been different iterations of it and one of the kind of things that changes very much each time is who what is what are the aliens and what are they doing so they have different mechanics or they have a different flavor or a different theme and so i think there's also a little question there about kind of uncertainty and mystery and i think that's kind of you definitely can do it because when you have a you have that core framework and when people jump in and they're like oh i've played this game before there does have to be something that is new so having the framework and then having something that can iterate or change it a little bit so it does keep that interest in there i think is really important mm. Definitely. And just before we move on, I've just remembered what I was uh, thinking of before, which is NSDM, the uh, National Security Decision Making Game. Those, uh, those guys in the UK have a, um, done a lot of work on this basic system that they use for a lot of different games. Um, yeah, so just a plug for those guys to check them out if you're interested, <laughs> but it's a system that they use in a lot of different, for a lot of different systems, basically. Would you say they're friends of the pod, Jack? Uh, sure, yeah. Friends of the pod. <laughs> um, Everyone's one, friends of the pod. Because I have to have the last say, I'm going to round that out by just saying one thing that I've found with that process of having a template is um, it often hinders, um, I've found anyway, through my process when I say, okay, I've got these three games or four games um, that make up a single mega game. 
and they interplay like they interplay with each other in this way. But now I can start reskinning them. I've I've often found myself eventually starting fresh once I hit this wall when I realize oh I can't actually make the watch this guy's war game look a certain way or feel a certain way and I just start adding bits and adding bits until it's a totally different game and then I you know the council game deteriorates and turns into two different things so I think um just broadly speaking having this framework that every that you could build a mega game off there's a lot of benefits there but I think it would it would uh it would need to be very loose um to be able to be very adaptable i suppose the looser it is the more adaptable it could be the more rigid it is the harder it would be to implement new new layers on top of it um but i might i might shoot us along and um i just wanted to run around and ask you guys um whether or not well i i, I guess i'll try and define what we're talking about when we're when we're referring to mechanics that we have stolen or adapted um how would you how would you define when in the scope of mega games um what makes a, me a mechanic worthy of actually bringing into your game so what kind of things are you looking at when you're when you're when you're trying to figure out is this mechanic uh, a good fit or when you've got an idea and you're trying to think what mechanic could i grab and adapt to this anyone want to kick off with that one <laughs> yeah i'm happy to kick that one off so uh what I really look for um, is something that is extremely simple. Uh, that's the first thing. And uh, because if you think about it, uh, your mega game has so much going on. If any one part of it was as complicated as a normal board game or video game or anything like that, then it would be completely unmanageable, right? You'd be like, oh, okay, we're going into the war map. Let's just sit down and read the rule book for Twilight Imperium. <laughs> like, you know, it would be <laughs> so. Um, Things like, I often look at things like lightweight games, um, things like um, uh, Condottier, which people might know as Gwent, uh, those kinds of games, which are quite simple. Uh, Gwent is a great example for people who've played The Witcher because it is intended to be a small part of a larger system. And that's the kind of thing that is really good. So simplicity, something that can be resolved really quickly. Ideally, it's something that's, simultaneous is what I look for because you've got so many people, right? You want it to be um, as scalable as possible so that if it turns out um, you've got 10 different people who are all trying to use this mechanic at once, uh, they, can, they can all use the mechanic at once, whatever it is. Like um, if it's trading or anything like that, you know, it, it, it's not something where people need to uh, take turns because then you'll end up with very a lot of difficulty getting a, um, everyone to um, do it at once. So yeah, I, I guess those are the two things is uh, simplicity, uh, scalability, and ideally, um, yeah, being uh, very quick to resolve, basically. Mm -hmm. Anything to I add on to that, um, you guys? I, I think the, 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 the key for me that, 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 that it's almost missing there, Jack is 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 it fun? Um, oh yeah, it's almost like my it's almost like my pub test, right? Is you sit down and say, "Hey, does this idea sound fun to you?" I've got I've got a friend who I just throw big game ideas at uh, sometimes, a couple of friends, but but one friend in particular, I just throw ideas, and they'll go, "Oh, uh, that sounds that sounds that sounds just like the bad part of this game," and I'm like, "You're right. Mm. Oh, I just took the <laughs> simple part, right?" Um, and so, yeah, sometimes a mechanic is really simple and sounds like easy to explain. Okay, you do this thing, really roll, roll 3d6 is equal. And if the result's equal this, you're good, right? That's actually the boring part of the game. And the, the good part's something else that you're missing. And, and quite often mm. that pub test of like, is this actually the fun, is this fun? Does it sound like a fun thing to do to you? Um, is, a, is a really quick way to, to, to reorient yourself when you're, when you're throwing something together. Mm. Um, but I do really like the idea that the mechanics need to be simple and and quickly resolved, um, because I, I've I've had some play tests. We we had a play test for a game that's currently in design. One of one of the other guys down here in Melbourne uh, is designing. A couple of the other guys are designing a game. We had a play test with a bunch of us, and one of their core mechanics was this really long process that took like twenty minutes to resolve. And during that time, we all got to chat and socialize. But the key thing that came out of that play test was it was just too meaty to to really be a good mm. mechanic. Um, and so that's gone back to the drawing board. But yeah, that, that simplicity uh, and, and the ability to, to see an effect really quickly, to know, okay, I've done this thing or I've made this choice. 
and that is going to have some sort of outcome I can directly see. Maybe not all the outcomes. I can't see, you know, okay, by making this decision, I know that I'm going to do these five things. But at least I know that one thing has happened because of the decision I've made. Um, demonstrable outcomes are really important, I think, in mechanics as well. Yep. Uh, what I'd add to that is intuitive. It's important that these games sure. mechanics are intuitive, and that's why, like, uh, importing an, an adoption can actually be really, really powerful because if you go back to games that people already recognize, if you started bringing games from Monopoly or poker or Risk, people kind of recognize them and then you can just like go forward with it. You don't necessarily need to teach it as much, but also looking to other inspiration from board games, you will sometimes pick up a game that's, brand new and has something in it and you're like oh this just works of course i know how this works in the setting and the mechanic or just a new thing like you know basically how it should work so things mm. like bag building you know okay i've got a bag when i reach in this i get to pull out a chip and it does something and it probably means that i reveal it and if mm. I, we put two cards down on the table all at the same time and then we flip them over when we flip them over we probably read all the cards at the same same point yeah that's yeah, actually definitely uh, sorry you go Justin. um that's actually something i want to i want to leap off it's where i find language is really useful and the idea of genre and trope is really useful because that lets you especially when you're talking to people that know either um and i'm going to separate the two ideas out here like trope mechanical tropes or like thematic tropes when you're talking mm. to people that either know one of those two realms it lets you communicate really quickly right if you're talking to other board game enthusiasts or people that know and talk about board games, right? If I say the word drafting or if I say the word engine building or uh, area control uh, or worker placement, those are instantly recognizable mechanics to some people that, that know those mechanics. They let you have conversations about concepts you'd have to otherwise explain really quickly and, and, and easily. And similarly with, with thematic tropes, right? If I say this game is a, a horror game set in a fantastical world, but uh, with an equivalent of a modern society sort of geopolitical sphere, you instantly start having an idea of, of this game already without actually me having explained what it is in depth that people do. Um, and so I find that yeah, when you're adapting the ability to, to have conversations in, in meta language, right? This language that talks about the, these other concepts really easily and succinctly is really powerful. Mm. Definitely. And is something that... I wanted to, oh, sorry. Uh, something <laughs> I wanted to uh, mention, it, it ties into something you were talking about before. I, I think one thing that can be a good way of thinking about your game is thinking about having an innovation budget. Like we were th talking about innovation before. Um, if every single mechanic in your game is completely new and something that no one's ever seen before, then it is much harder for people to get into your game. If a lot of it is based in, uh, uh, but on the other side of things, if everything is tropes and everything is something that people have seen before, then it might not be as interesting. So what can be good is to um, think about, all right, we're going to start people out with mechanics that are very simple and basic, and then they've got this one interesting twist to them that makes it interesting and innovative, tying it into the theme. So think about, all right, people can get into it through this mechanic that they understand or this trope that they understand or the genre trope. And then there is a little bit of extra stuff in there. But um, yeah, just thinking about um, innovation or, or unique, interesting, different mechanics as like a resource that you're using that if every single thing is different, it uh, it can end up being a bad thing. As long as definitely uh, stealing that, I love it. Um, innovation budget. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, just quickly that I think we can tie together and are actually a bit relevant to what we're talking about. Oh, I'm also worth noting, Jason, you lost a couple of the audience members mentioning mentioning Monopoly, so hopefully we can <laughs> win them back. Um, but no. it also begs to question, when are we going to see the Monopoly mega game? And uh, does it actually, you know, is it viable? I think it is. But um, so another question from Zane was, so there's two questions here, I think, that we can kind of cover. Um, from Zane, is, is there anything that we can do to help people learn in games before the game? Which I think we've actually kind of touched on a little bit. But then also from Ed, um, 
Is there a risk that designers who are too board game literate build mechanisms which seem simple but are actually impenetrable to, to non-board gators, gamers? And how do we avoid that? So just broadly, um, how do we help people learn our games before them? And what do we, how do we avoid them being too board game um, literate, I suppose? Any ideas there? Any thoughts? So I think um, I'll start off. Uh, I, um, so there's a lot of things we can do in terms of we can provide people with a manual. We can try, uh, we can even, uh, some uh, designers release videos with brief explanations of the rules before people show up. Um, that kind of stuff is really great from a, but I'll, I'll bring it back to the design perspective. When you're actually making the game, how can you make a game that is easy to learn? And I think it comes down to that simplicity and being aware of using tropes that people understand. Like with uh, It Belongs in a Museum, it's like, all right, this is an Indiana Jones inspired game. We're gonna use the Indiana Jones stuff. That will make it easier for people to get into because they're like, oh, of course it works this way because that's the kind of thing that would happen in an Indiana Jones movie. So that's a brief answer is what I would say to think about when you're actually making the game. I um I would totally agree with that and, and throw on there. I think that um, in the sphere, I mean, in, in both senses, how do you teach people a game? And also how do you make sure it's not too sort of dicey is um is through play testing i think um both in through the design process and the testing process the broader appeal like the broader amount of people that you can that you can get involved um with the play testing and sort of the the spitballing of ideas like you were saying just in the pub test the better um one example that springs to mind was with for the crown where quite late in the design process we sat down to um to play test the naval mechanics and it just went out the window and was redesigned right there and then it ended up being something really fun, um, totally different mechanic. Um, and it was all because um, someone, some lead designer um, had gotten way too crunchy and wanted a war game um, on a little hex map and doing all this stuff. So it turned into this really fun dice game, which was really rewarding because it was like throwing broadsides at each other. Um, so yeah, I think, in, and it just happened like that. It was after weeks and weeks of development, we just came up with this with this new thing. Um, so I think playtesting, exposing your ideas to a broad amount of people. So you have those voices saying, I don't get it. I don't read board game uh, manuals ever in my spare time. <laughs> and then others who say, um, you know, this is this is way too light. Um, I need more more numbers and stuff. And then you can embark on the impossible journey of pleasing both group, groups. Um, anything else, Jason and Tristan? I was just going to say, like, in terms of helping people learning the game before the game, like, manual design is also, like, a little bit of a, an mm. art. And so that manual needs to kind of help people learn the game, but also help them to direct them how to learn the game. And so one, I think, helpful thing that we do have in mega games is that kind of clear different structure um, in terms of, these are the rules that this player needs to know because they're a diplomat. And so they know they can just read the diplomat rules. They know what's really important for them to learn. But the game itself also kind of builds on that structure because you are going to have a point where there's going to be a control member in a room and they're going to start playing, you know, the first game and we can explain, we can tell, we can ask for any questions. And generally what does happen is there is a second teach there and then people fall back to the menu when they have any questions. But often there is what we found is people run around and the people are the manual. The, mm. uh, the manual does not survive <laughs> once the <laughs> game actually starts running. Yeah. The, I found the manual is mostly just for me. <laughs> like the game yeah. control. Like, oh, what game was that control. Cool? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Panicking and in the well, corner, trying to, trying to find where was this page? Mm. Oh, what happens when you have the designer in the room is if someone asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I don't go to the manual, oh, I go to Jack. Yeah. So he starts being a, a walking living <laughs> manual that everyone is checking. And then I and then I make up the answer because I, I don't know. I was like, oh yeah, Which I is, to put in a rule for that. Or Which I make up the answer right? if I can't find him. But it's mm. like it's interesting in that in that scale of um 
I think there's another discussion which you can leap off there in terms of empowering control, right? There's this whole idea I think we have in mega games where control is essentially mini dungeon, mini dungeon masters, game masters, right? They each have their their own level of authority, but when something certainly impacts the game to to a to a scale that's that's maybe not outside the, outside their sphere of influence, that, that you know you're encouraged to cooperate and collaborate and run ideas past each other. But a key part of mega games is that mechanics emerge throughout the game, right? The player says, mm. "Hey, so I want to." go to the moon and you go that's not in the game you can't all right sure give me these resources and we'll make it up and we'll fig we'll figure it out right and so Definitely. there's an inherent part of mega games which is essentially adapting mechanics on the fly which i don't mm. know like i think is, is almost comes from the role-playing games world rather than, than the, the board games designing the mechanics beforehand world yeah yeah absolutely absolutely, absolutely. i, I want to talk more about that for sure in a sec i just want to um to say something about Ed Silverstone's uh, question, is there a risk of designers who are too board game literate making things that non-board gamers don't understand or that mm. seem impenetrable? Uh, there is a huge risk of that for sure. And I think the solution to that is to um, play test your game or talk about your game with a um, broad range of people from different backgrounds, right? Mm. Is to talk about it with board gamers, talk about it to non-board gamers and see if their eyes glaze over, right? And, mm. and, you know, not just board games and non-board games, obviously, but just talking about it um, with as many people as you can find who have different backgrounds and experiences. And that'll solve a lot of pitfalls in terms of, it's easy, I think, sometimes to get in your own head if you're making a mega game, maybe you're talking about it with a couple of friends mostly. And so you're making something that seems fantastic to you and those couple of friends, but is are other people going to, um, appreciate the same thing and the only way to know is to talk about it you know hmm. and maybe I think also that's a... sorry Jason sorry I was just gonna say like I, I I do agree but I think that's one of the things that's a little bit different when we talk about board game design and mega game design is mega games is actually designed for like a much much broader audience because it's mm. not just the person that's really interested in the game it's the person that's really interested in the game and has convinced their friend to come along and so we can't just design for people that want to play a particular type of game. It has to be broad and accessible and openable to people who haven't played a mega game before, who people haven't played a board game before. But when you play a board game, often you are designing games that are scoped a lot more to people who have played board games, like the theme, like the mechanics, and have read them, read a little bit, and they're like, okay, I'm excited to play this game because it's like these other games that I want to play you have much more of a complexity and an innovation budget and all those things that you can actually put in a board game. But when you come back to a mega game, you need to go back to basics, keep it simple. And of course, yeah, play test, play test, play test. Mm. And um, so, oh, sorry, Patrick. Um, uh, so one of the things I try to do is have it, to tackle that problem when you have some people who are super, perhaps they've played a lot of board games or they want the crunchy, mechanics whether it's role-playing board games wherever it is and then you have some people who are interested in lighter mechanics i think it's good to have a range of those in your mega game where the people who want lighter mechanics can involve themselves in the politics section and the people who want more crunchy mechanics can go to the warm -up. i think that's good to do. Mm, yeah i think that's one of the one of those areas where you potentially have more control over uh, designing for the audience compared to board games because you can have those multiple multiple spheres but mm -hmm. at the same time it can still scare people off um the the, the final thing i was going to say on top of all the play testing and exposing ideas to people is something i'm guilty of and that's probably knowing when a game is done and when it's not and i think continuing to design through iterations as it gets played which is something hard for us in australia we don't we don't run our games many times compared to to other parts of the world but i think there's a lot to be said about actually putting it out there and having it run and then realizing okay it turns out we thought we'd nailed this part but nobody on the day understood it until three hours in so next game we need them to understand it in the first hour and in sort of design design by doing i suppose um which is hard <laughs> yeah no i totally i totally hear that in terms of redesigning almost like i was saying on the fly but also you know after an iteration um 
that's really important, especially we're looking at running it. So we're running it belongs to the museum twice. And I know we've only got two weeks between the two runs of the game. Uh, so I'm going to have to really struggle to, to not redesign in that two weeks. Mm. So I'm going to take all the things we sit in the pub afterwards and talk about um, and, and get that feedback. And we're like, I know I'm running this in two weeks. I would change these things, but all the materials are printed. The rules have been sent out already. I'm going to have to accept and be at peace with that. And I'm already mentally preparing myself um, for that, that challenge, I guess. I did yep. want to touch on one thing. Again, I wanted to kind of reinforce Jack's point about diversity um, and not just diversity in terms of experience with board games, but actually diversity in terms of cultural, um, uh, sex backgrounds, religion backgrounds, actual physical diversity of people. Um, it's so, so, so important That's because uh, my my co-founder at Melbourne Games, Nelly, is uh, fantastic. She's brilliant. Um, but so sometimes I sat down and said, oh, obviously things can go this way, right? And she said, no, that's not how it needs to work. anything about this. And it's just brought a perspective that I would never, have personally um, because of my experience in life and where, where I'm at um, and something that I'm, I'm really keen to see more of is diversity in, in the mega gaming space um, both in design in play test and in actually playing the games um, we're, we're obviously a young a, a young hobby um, uh, relatively especially in Australia um, but it is really important to make sure that we we uh, as designers have a, a, a job in empowering and amplifying people's voices when they have feedback about our games especially when they are diverse voices yeah absolutely I don't think there's um, I think it's kind of like a, a universal truth at this point that the diversity of ideas and collaboration are two things that you just can't really trump when it comes to creating something that's going to be universally accepted. Um, I wanted to m quickly move on to um, a question about specifically on the on the theme of adopting mechanics or ideas into a mega game. And I wanted to ask you guys, have you adopted mechanics or inspiration for mechanics from somewhere other than a board game or a video game? So there are these real world things um, or, or, you know, I don't even know, uh, but are there things that you've grasped and pulled in and thought, I'm going to turn this into a mechanic because it actually suits suits the mega game. Um, I've got I've got one example, which is a bit of a cop out, but I'm going to use it because I think it's interesting to sort of analyze my my design process. And that is that um, I'm a bureaucrat and I've layered bureaucracy in a lot of my games because I want to simulate the inefficiencies of or, you know, of bureaucratic systems. So um, as the fire dies, uh, which was this post-apocalyptic survival game, built into it are elections. And then um, the people in charge who, who've succeeded in winning these elections have paperwork and they have things they have to sign and they have a lot of, a lot of um, oversight of things, but it's very high level and they have to rely on advice from below because they actually are unable to go and see see the details of things and I, and and so that was a very um this like a deliberate design goal in that game um but once i realized where i was getting that from i started to realize i've, I've layered that into a lot of a lot of my designs um solely because i i just love the i don't love it in practice but i love the <laughs> idea of um how communication and collaboration works and often breaks down um, in, a, in very hierarchical um, bureaucracy. So if you guys ever stumbled upon anything like that that you've put into your board game or your mega game that's um, a non-traditional mechanic or you've made it a mechanic? <laughs> nope. Uh, I haven't uh, said... Oh, you go, Jay. Uh, well, yeah, like l less so for mega games. I think mega games often the inspiration like it will very come very strongly from culture. So like it'll have mm -hmm. a very strong thematic theme and then it'll kind of go back to, to board game, but go back to board games from mechanics or go back to other mega games from mechanics um, in terms of like bringing things into actual board games. The thing that I've done recently is a little print and play game where you cut with um, paper. And so that's like a, a slightly different mechanic mm -hmm. Um and so sometimes I think a thing that we can start thinking about with mega games is, and the thing that I've thought about a little bit in terms of where we are in terms of the global pandemic is like players touching players, you know, passing things around. And if there's any innovation that we can take there and that can come from, you know, other systems, which will probably be video games. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I haven't taken direct mechanical inspiration, I think, from real life or from other things, but I definitely take a lot of inspiration in terms of the feel or the atmosphere mm. or the the feeling I want to create um, from real life. Like um, uh, for one of the games I've been trying to design. Uh, so as a kid, I grew up on the back of a national park and I used to explore in the woods a lot there. Mm. And I really wanted to capture the feel that I had like exploring in those woods. And that doesn't translate to a specific mechanic, but it is about trying to evoke that same atmosphere of exploration. I guess. Yep. Yep. Um, and I think. I'm sorry, you're right. No, no, no. Wrap this um, up. The <laughs> other, the other thing I think that that's interesting when you're looking at um, mechanics and um, specifically in this case, non-traditional mechanics, like not deriving them from board games or, or video games, is that mega games are sort of kind of i like to say exist in this spectrum of gaming um where you know board games and video games are kind of down this one end but they've got really specific mechanics and then sort of role-playing games are far up this other end but there are other things that exist in this space as well that i like to look at and sort of pull from things like model united nations which have quite strict rate, like routine and that bureaucracy you're talking about but then mm -hmm. also like sort of sit adjacent to mega games and then on, on, the, on the other side of that things like immersive theater um there's been some really interesting experiences um, which are sort of uh, much more improvisational that I, I've, I've looked at and I haven't pulled directly into a mega game yet, but I'm, I'm itching to. Um, yeah. Things like planting actors. I remember with God Emperor, we were so lucky when we ran it to, to be able to have one of our controllers who was an actor um, actually, you know, go in as the God Emperor and he just had the best time. We had the best time. The players awesome. gave us such great feedback about how good it was having this planted, like, character that was able mm. to, to drive narrative um not narrative we'd pre-written but narrative based on that spontaneous goals in the same way the players had it but with more of a more of an endorsement from the game itself so like um i think we can draw mechanics almost from the way other mediums work right whether that be pulling actors from immersive theater or pulling uh hard and fast electronic systems from video games, right? Uh, pulling bureaucracy from government. Uh, I think almost finding the underpinning like formats that, that exist in other worlds um, and pulling them into our world. Uh, I think another example of that is like print media, um, forcing press teams to write print media can be really hinder or hindrance in some worlds. In some worlds, it can be, in some mega games, it can be a really powerful tool to, to, to build the thematic experience in that world. So I think it's almost not, not yep. necessarily looking at mechanics, but the, the way other mediums work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll, I had exactly the same reaction to the God Emperor, having having a God Emperor there. And it really opened up my mind in, in terms of having some theatrics to the games. Um, one last question from the audience um, that I feel like we've touched on a little bit, but it'd be we could probably just wrap it up in a little package um, from Dominic. Uh, how do you balance the need for rules to be understandable um, versus the need for there to be some uncertainty and mystery that needs to be discovered throughout the, the game? Um, and I might just start by saying I know one way of not doing that well which was um, with one of my, my games, the pirating adventure game, we were experimenting with, um, with that concept, I suppose, with rules being mysteries and they become um, revealed as the game goes on. And also with the idea of like, not legacy style, but kind of where, where things change throughout the game. And so the rule book for that game was, I think, um, two or three pages and they were just one pages that highlighted some of the key mechanics. And then when people started to dig for treasure on an island or they started to have um, boarding actions in their pirate ship battles or whatever, they opened an envelope that was on their table from the start that then introduced them to that next part of the mechanics. So they didn't know that at the start of the game and they didn't have to. Um, I think it was really fun. <laughs> it was a really exciting idea, but I, it didn't it didn't satisfy a lot of people who then went in I was that? Um, and, and actually got quite frustrated um, that they didn't have all the information at the start. So there's a balancing act mm -hmm. there. Um, but what do you guys think about that, um, about having rules that are very understandable, but also having some uncertainty and mystery in them? How, how do you juggle that? Uh, I, th I, I think the rules need to be understandable 
then the uncertainty mystery doesn't necessarily need to come from the rules. I think they kind of essentially mm. come from the content and they also come from the other players, of course, because other mm. players will introduce a variety of things. Um, watch the sc- watch the skies or we are not alone or they generally have, you know, that other team. So that's your big amount of mystery. Mm. Um, yep. And so, yeah, it did, well, I think there's probably cases where players will go, oh, how does this work? And the uncertainty mystery there is that you don't know how it works until someone has <laughs> asked you how it works. And you're like, well, it works like this. Yeah. And I feel I like actually I... one of the one of the key um, sort of safeguards against that is probably a really obvious one. And that is that you don't, you shouldn't really say no. You shouldn't, when people do come up with ideas that are in the game, it's probably best not to immediately say, um, no, you can't actually do that in this game. Sometimes there's 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 a time and place for that. But I think it's something maybe we just take for granted that does happen in control groups. Um, but yeah, you definitely need to enable the players if they're going to be the mystery. Yeah, it's almost like improv theater. You say yes and whenever you yeah. can. Um, you, you take their ideas and leap off it. And that's that's part of the the, the, the fun of, of not just having controllers, but having players come to your games is they get to, to leap off and almost add their own mechanics into making games. That's where the the um, immersive storytelling really, really comes out in that it is emergent and it's immersive. You're immersed in it, but then you you, you add bits to it that emerge and build into their own, own wider narratives. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing that I was really keen to touch on with regards to this um, is that I think very distinctly to me, the systems need to be clear. The systems that are in place that players can entangle with and, and get themselves into need to be clear. I need to understand how those work. It's the the, the content and the, the outcomes of those. It's almost like the data that, that goes into and out of those isn't clear, right? I don't know what other people have. I, don't, I know what I have, but I don't know what the other things other people have. I don't know how they're going to use them. I don't know what's going to happen necessarily if they put their data in and I put my data in and it comes out to the other mm. side. Um, but I know what the system does. And if I put my thing in here, it might have, it should have this reliable outcome. Mm. It's the, it's the, the mysteries and little factors. Okay. That maybe, maybe someone else added something else different in there, or I don't know how it's going to look in five turns time. That's where the interesting complications come from. Right. Or I know that if I succeed in a skill check, I'll get a result, but I don't know what the full result of that will be. Right. Um, mm. it, it's partially obfuscating some of the, the information that makes uh, for that that emergent storytelling and, and mechanics to be palatable um, without being dull. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, um, yeah, I, I, so my personal design philosophy is definitely that the rules themselves, I don't think need to be mysterious. I think they can be if you're interested in that, but I don't think that's necessary at all. Um, if you think about a role-playing game, all of the rules are there in the book for the role-playing game but you still don't know what's going to happen when you sit down to a session, right? You don't know what's around the next room or what's around the next corner. Uh, and mega games are the same. You can, even if you know how the game works and how you, how to resolve things, um, it, it can still be mysterious and exciting and interesting. Um, in the cases where you do want mystery, the way I would usually do that is that some teams get part of the rules and other teams get the other part of the rules. Like in Watch the Skies, how the aliens and humans have different parts of the rules. But mm. yeah, the way I usually do it is that those parts of the rules are complete. They know if I attack a thing, this is how it'll work. This is how we resolve it. Um, yeah, it's just that the, the interaction of those two is how it works. And I think definitely mm. if... Uh, I think there is some benefit to having mysterious rules that the players don't quite know how it, they work. But I think the downside is big enough where it can cause confusion and, and this kind of thing that I feel like personally, I prefer to get my mystery in other ways. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, I might round us out with one final question um, that may have spoilers or, or maybe teasers in it. But um, from each of you guys, from a design perspective, is there a mechanic that you're just dying to use to in the mega game world? Like a mechanic that you've either come up with or that you've witnessed somewhere else and you're really looking for that opportunity to implement it in a mega game. Um, I'll, 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 I'll jump in first and just say the two things that I've always wanted to do. Um, Jack, you mentioned earlier the bag building. I'm really keen to see that in a mega game. I haven't yet. I'm not sure if, it, if it's been done but I've just recently started to be introduced to games that use that. So I'm really, really keen to see what it could be like on a broad scale. It seems really adaptable to like a, a more role play 
game where everyone's their own character or their own person that does things. Mm. Um, and then the other one is a bit boring, but just the um, the the event resolution mechanic from the Battlestar Galactica board game, yep. where everyone's <laughs> th- throwing cards in. Um, yeah. And it's an anonymously sort of um, abstracted and, and sabotaged. Um, I don't know if that's been directly used in a mega game either, but I'd love to. I'd love to give it a go. I'm not saying you should keep an eye out on some games we have got coming out later this year. Pat, but <laughs> maybe that's a good idea. I'll be down there. <laughs> Um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll give the, yeah. the, the mechanic I, I'm really interested in bringing in isn't so much a mechanic from a board or video game. It's actually one from theatre again. It's proper space activation. It's having different mm. spaces. We do this a little bit in mega games, but I'm really keen. I have this vivid memory of going to see uh, in the gardens a, a version of Wind in the Willows, right? And you'd go around different parts of the gardens and you'd see the, the frogs on the, you'd see like the like toad on, on, on the river having, and you'd see this bit of theatre there and then you'd move somewhere else. There'd be a whole other scene somewhere else. And I'd love really deeply to do um, a space activated mega game that had the mechanics and the events that occurred in different spaces tied to those spaces and potentially features of those spaces. Um, mm. I'm still struggling to find one that, that, that fits, uh, that isn't just a mm-hmm. modern day society one. Um, but, but yeah, I'd really love to tie in the space that you're using to the, the mega game that you're playing in a deep way. So yeah, you stole cool. both it. Both of you have stolen my ones, <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, so that, that idea of space activation is definitely something I'll expand on that I'm really interested in. The mechanic I really want to use for a mega game is one from your mega games, Patrick, uh, which is from your mega game, um, Chaos on the Iron Sea, I think it was called, uh, the mm. pirate mega game. Um, and the mechanic I really loved there is about using physical space, like in a Watch the Skies mega game, it's kind of abstract where your character is. You know, you go to the war map or you go to the thing. The space is split up by the strategy or by the by the game that you're playing. Uh, Chaos in the Iron Sea was split up by the place you are going to. So if you go to a particular island, your crew and your ship needs to go to that room that is that island. And then you can only talk to people who are on that island with you. Um, I thought that was awesome for like an, a feel of exploration. And that's something I really want to, develop more mm. in a future game for sure. Yep. Um, one of the things that um, I'm excited to see is like having a slightly more complex trading and economy system. And mm. from all the things we've talked about, that's actually quite a hard thing to do because you don't want it to be too complex. You don't want it to have to be understandable. Um, and like an inspiration for that, that I'd be excited to see is sidereal confluence. Um, because it has like a pretty complicated economy because you just have like different pieces and being able to have different pieces that you trade and you bring back and the complexity there comes from everybody has different ways and different things that they want in order to be able to convert resources to different stuff. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Economy has always been a really hard one to nail. I've found Mm-hmm. Um, economy in mega games is so difficult it, i feel yeah. like that's the thing that most frequently just completely blows up or goes out the window mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. is fine usually right like if everyone <laughs> ends up with infinity dollars at the end of the game you're like oh well you know everyone gets yeah. to do their cool thing but, it's self-balancing yeah. right yeah <laughs> everybody it's has definitely dollars. it's definitely um self-balancing um, in that pirate game where one one team just became millionaires and um, abused the, the economy system. They were merchants, yeah, the, though, so it made sense. The, the merchants just hoarded 100% of the gold, so <laughs> everyone else had nothing. Everyone else was dirt poor, which was thematic, but it worked. Yeah, it was, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, well, I think that wraps us up. We're right on time. Um, thank you guys for having this conversation, and thanks to everyone who, who listened along live. And... Um, and ask some questions. We've just got a note there, a plug from Becky worth throwing out that uh, True North is actually doing a design symposium in April, so just next month, and it's going to be about um, economy in in mega games. So worth tuning into. Um, uh, Tristan, where can people find you and learn more about Melbourne Mega Games? 
So primarily we're on we're on Facebook at the moment. We we do have a, a, a burgeoning up and coming website. But if you search Melbourne Mega Games, we're on, on Facebook there. Or you can email us at melbournemegagames at gmail.com um, if you want to get get any info from us. Uh, we've got a, game, a couple of games coming up next month. Game one of It Belongs in the Museum is sold out, but game two still has a couple of places left. Uh, they're in April of 2021. But we also have plans for a few other games, including an original game, which I teased a few mechanics of um, in this, this session yeah. called The Ark. So yes, that's oh, us. Yeah. Excellent. Jason, um, can people find you anywhere and are you are you working on anything at the moment? Um, you can kind of find me around the internet, but I'm really not that much on social media these days. <laughs> yeah. Um so yeah, if you message me on Twitter, I will be on Twitter, which is just on Jason Kotzer. I do have a website which is jasonkotzer.com. Um I have just released a little game. Um and you should, well, maybe you can't actually find that at the moment because we're almost pressing production on that. Um, okay. But if you were interested, it is, um, as I said before, it's, it's a paper cutting game and it has a few different mechanics. It's part role play, part craft. Um, and you can just message me about it and I'll tell you about it if you like. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely put a, keep, keep us informed about when that goes out mm-hmm. and we'll put a link in the, in the podcast. And Jack. Yeah, people can find me at uh, jack at ashtowngames.com. Awesome. You guys can find me at the sydneymegagamers.com and on Facebook and everywhere else that we are. And um, this has been the great game. We've got a Discord. We've got a website. You can email us. There'll be all the links attached to this podcast. Um, thanks for Megacon for hosting us. I'm looking forward to um, watching some of the videos, the recordings from the seminars there. And we'll also be sharing that on our socials. And thanks to you guys for having this, this chat. It was really good. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much, awesome. everyone. Thanks All so right. much for joining us today. Um, just very quickly from from me, that is the end of of day one of of Megacon. Uh, sorry, day two of Megacon. I'm getting confused. It's <laughs> eleven o'clock at night over here. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was a fantastic talk. Really, really, some some fantastic me- uh, mega game mechanic ideas. Um, so for everyone who has stayed with us this long, thank you so much. Uh, but please remember to come back tomorrow bright and early, 11 o'clock. We've got Red Planet Rising kicking off at 11. And then we've got Patrick Rose's Eddie Port in a Storm about t- turning a physical mega game into an online mega game. So those are going to be some great, uh, some great events. Um, if you want to stick around, the pub is open 24-7 in the Megacon Discord server. So we'll see you in there. Thanks again to Jack, Patrick, Jason, and Tristan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye.